We are back. Giants baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I'm here with the host of the show, the esteemed Michael Duca. How are you, sir? I am fine. Ralph, I've often wondered, is the alternative to Comfortably Zoned Comfortably Man on Man? Interesting, as Artie because Jones that that said. more accurately describes our show. At least we are comfortable. <laughs> right. Well, Artie Johnson would describe our show, right? Very interesting. Very interesting, but dumb. But stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, Artie would be wrong. This is not. This is not stupid in any way. Anyway, you're a giant historian. Um, I go. Be- I can't describe myself in those terms, but I go way back with the Giants before they were the San Francisco Giants, when they were the New York Giants. And the subject we're going to talk about today is catching, so I might um, start with the catcher of my youth, because this show is past, present, future, Um, and the Giants are the same franchise they were when they were in New York. And the catcher of my youth was a fellow who later went on to coach uh, with the San Francisco Giants. Uh, Let me guess. The Mets briefly was traded for Cookie Lavagetto, two coaches being traded for each other uh, with the Mets, and um, his name was Wes Westrom. Yes, sir. Uh, he, Poughkeepsie, New York, that's where he was from. And um, he was a terrific defensive catcher, really couldn't hit a lick, and um, was um, among the three catchers, the three terrific defensive catchers, was in New York, Yogi Berra, Roy Campanella with the Dodgers, Yogi uh, naturally with the Yankees, and with the Giants, Wes Westrom. Um, he was totally overshadowed by those sluggers who could catch as well. But um, two times, 1951 and in 1958, in 1954, um, he was the catcher when they won pennants in the World Series in 54. I think Jim, uh, Ray Cott was, uh, got most of the catching uh, by 54, but... That being said, um, that's my um, contribution as a New York Giant fan. And in 58, they moved to San Francisco. And um, kind of an indescript uh, guy, Bob Schmidt, was the regular catcher in 58, if I recall. And since then, we've had many memorable ones um, between Schmidt and the current future Hall of Famer, uh, Posey. Um, let's start with him. He's a Hall of Famer. You got uh, If he stops playing tomorrow, he's elected five years from now. Would you? Would you agree, Michael? He may not have in enough years to do that, but he certainly has in enough quality years to do that. Um, of course, if he were to stop playing tomorrow, there would have to be some sort of reason, a la Sandy Koufax, and, and that might be a mitigating factor, too. Uh, right. Yeah, there, there, there's no doubt about it that uh, Posey is, um, you know, one of the more unusual talents that you'll see in, in baseball because this was a kid who, at the highest level of amateur baseball in, you know, in the College World Series, uh, caught, played shortstop, and was the closer for the Florida State Seminoles. Um, unfortunately, his last time on the mound was not a very memorable one. I believe he gave up six runs to Stanford in the ninth inning uh, in a game that uh, knocked the Seminoles out of the championship. But a uh, very, very versatile guy. Uh, also played a lot of shortstop in college, uh, third base, um, you know, he's, uh, he's truly unusual in that he's an athlete who chose to catch. Uh, generally speaking, at least in my day and probably in yours too, Ralph, catcher was the last position you filled on the team because 
you know, everybody uh, truly believed that those were the tools of ignorance. But Buster Posey right. has generally, genuinely told people that ain't the, uh, the way it is, and it's not the way it's probably going to be in the future. I think he's set a bit of a norm for catchers and their athleticism. Um, what impresses me about him is his comeback from that horrendous ankle injury and uh, just wanting to co- come back in the, in the first place um, is heroic from something like that. Um, and he did it, and I don't think he's the worst for wear. Um, uh, it doesn't show up in his game that he would he was hurt. Had, he wasn't a speedster to begin with. Do you notice he slowed down on the bases? Is that something that um, I'm missing? Yeah, I think I think his let's let's put it this way: his acceleration time uh, is probably longer than it used to be. It probably takes him longer to get up to full speed, um, and and that's certainly understandable. You know, it's. Um, uh, you just, as you started talking about that, I just realized for the first time, I think, Ralph, that I was physically in the stadium both when he had a foot dangling by, you know, soft tissue from the rest of his body that had been. Oh, I think I think it. you're going to recall Dravecki. Am I correct? Oh, I was there for that too, but no, I, I wasn't there when his arm broke because that was in Montreal. I was there for his comeback game. No, I was there for, um, uh, oh gosh, and now I'm blanking on the name, catcher with the Pirates in Oakland, Jason, oh gosh, his dad uh, was a catcher. Too. Oh, yes, yes, he played played with Oakland, uh, Kendall, Jason Kendall. Yes, thank you, Freddie Kendall was his dad, played for the Padres. Yeah, I was going to say that. Um, <laughs> it's amazing yeah, how we yeah. could think Freddie Kendall come up with that probably faster than Jason Kendall. Um, yeah, well, that's because we're old. <laughs> yes, um, yes. But, but I, and I'm I, older. You're, <laughs> you're old, I, and I'm older. <laughs> well, you're 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 just yeah. And I appreciate the fact that you're leaving those little trails of crumbs for me to follow because I'm not far behind. Um, oh, um, well, I hope you don't catch up. I, I, wow. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I was, uh, but I was there in the ballpark in Oakland when. Uh, Kendall so gruesomely did almost the same thing to his foot by uh, stepping on the base wrong. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting. It's a very rare injury. I can only remember it happening twice in my lifetime. And, you know, it, it, it's quite a coincidence that I was actually physically in the ballpark to see both of those happen. Hey, I, who was it? Was it Tarkanian? Not Tarkanian. Um, quarterback with played with Minnesota and the Giants. Um, well, you're, got you're thinking of Fran Tarkenton, but I don't Fran think Tarkenton, an ankle like right. that. I don't think you're it right. was an, an ankle like that. I think it was, uh, um, the, the, oh, golly, and now I'm blanking on this guy's name, too. He, he did play quarterback for the Redskins uh, um, and, and, and then had his – Sonny Jurgensen. No, 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 no. He, he's been a commentator for many years. Had his shin uh, you literally almost folded in half on, on Monday Night Football. Um, the similar injury to the one Napoleon Kaufman suffered. But goodness, let's not get off into the into a show about the most gruesome injuries I've ever seen. Um, right. I'm, I'm I'm too old to want to think about being hurt. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, speaking of that, as uh, Nancy Finley and um, and Jerry Feidelberg and I did a show that um, you heard the tail end of before this on the A's, we're talking about that horrible instance where last night a foul ball in Yankee Stadium off the bat of Todd Frazier hit a little girl right in the, in the face. And um, the whole controversy of how Major League Baseball recommended that the nettings be extended and uh, some teams are are compi- uh, complying with that and some teams aren't. Some teams are doing it slower than others. And uh, this is going to increase the rate of... Um, I, I, of I can talk about that. 
I can Please. talk about that because I happen to even be involved in collecting some of the statistics that Major League Baseball used to make that decision. Um, those nettings, uh, the Major League Baseball recommended that the nettings be extended to the home plate end of the dugout, and that's been done in most stadiums. The foul ball that you saw last night would not have been in any way mitigated by nettings, even if they were built to the fullest extent that MLB has recommended. There's a couple things, multiple things that I think have to be kept in mind here. I am reminded when my own son was five years old, we went to the All-Star Game in Anaheim. It was the All-Star Game that Rick Russell started, the All-Star Game where Bo Jackson uh, hit a ball out under what was then the batter's eye in Anaheim before the uh, Disney folks put the rock pile out there. And in those days, there was a skills competition the day before, and it was only $5. You went and watched batting practice, and they had some throwing competitions and some base running competitions. It was pretty low-level amateur stuff, but it was uh, it was entertaining, and it was only five bucks. Unlike today, when uh, you know the home run derby is a uh, hundred and twenty-five dollar per person ticket. Is that what that so, is really? Oh yeah, all all of the All Star events are pretty oh expensive. Um, I think the Futures game was seventy-five dollars when it was here in San Francisco ten years ago, if memory serves. But in any event. Um, at that batting practice with my five-year-old son, it was open seating. You could sit anywhere you wanted. And I had a five-year-old with me, and my son had a prenatal stroke, so he has a mild form of cerebral palsy. He's high-functioning. He's a father of two now. But um, he's uh, right-side hemiplegic, and so his reactions and reflexes are not very quick, as you would expect. So we decided to sit on the second deck. We decided to sit in the plaza deck. And directly below us, a family of four came in and sat down in the second row just past the third base dugout. Uh, and the way they decided to sit was uh, Dad, being nice and kind and, and generous, decided to let the kids have the best view. So he sat closest to the foul pole. Mom sat next to him, and the two kids sat closest to home plate. Bo Jackson was taking batting practice, and he hit a ball to the top of the batter's eye. And as we were all staring out to center field in awe, watching that ball roll back down the batter's eye, the next pitch came in, and he lined it foul, and he lined it directly off the side of the youngest child's head sitting down in front of us. And my son was horrified, and I said, that is why I'm sitting on the home plate side of you. And that is why parents need to think when they seat themselves and their children at a baseball game. Kids are absolute sensory sponges. They're going to soak in everything around them. The guy next to them with the faux hawk and the crazy person trying to dunk his blue cotton candy and his Coca-Cola and all the stuff that's happening around them distracts their attention from the thing that is important, which is that there's a big man over there launching, if you will, potentially lethal weapons at them. Right. Um, but, Michael, we're all, adult fans as well, subject to this because it's impossible to go to a game and concentrate the entire time. You look down. Maybe you're scoring the game. Maybe you look away to chat with say, with a fan about a certain play. Um, the onus has to be on the stadium or the powers that be that run the stadium to provide the protection. Um, you know, where you're sitting should not be for everybody. Let's put it that way. Um and my response to that is that the people who are sitting right next to the field have made a conscious choice to pay extra money to have the closest and most unadulterated experience they can have. I don't think that the people who paid $7,500 apiece for charter seats 
behind the dugout at AT AT&T are going to be very happy about somebody putting a 20-foot high netting in front of them. In fact, I think they would be so incensed that they might even sue over it. Um, The the reality is... But I I wonder if they'd collect as much money as the parents of the little girl who's suing because there wasn't a net. Well, if if they've decided already that they're suing, then... Oh, I don't know. I don't know if they... That's just off the top of my head. I... Well, I, I would encourage you, I would encourage you, I would encourage everyone. <clears throat> you know, as I've told my kids all the time growing up, and I tell my wife from time to time, and it irritates the hell out of them when I say this too, but all the words matter. And the words that matter are the words that are written on the back of your ticket. Everybody gets a ticket to get into the ball game, and the ticket says, the holder agrees to all the policies and regulations promulgated by the Giants and their affiliates pertaining to events held at the park. Warning, holder assumes all risk and danger incidental to the game of baseball, the event, tour, exhibition. Holder agrees the Giants and their affiliates, Major League Baseball, and the National League participating clubs, any player, any event host, performer, and their respective agents, employees, and other individuals, shall not be liable for any personal injury, bodily harm, loss, or damage to property caused by the event, including without... Well, that sounds like the Miranda rights. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you... you know, what, what it simply says is you are buying this well-informed that the game can be dangerous. There are signs everywhere in AT&T Park, at least, down at the bottom of all the rows and even on some of the walls in the middle of the sections down there at the field level saying, beware of flying objects from the field. If somebody hits a baseball, the sound's going to get to you before the baseball is going to get to you. If you're talking to somebody and you hear the crack of the bat, you better look. Uh, I I have literally, Ralph, I have literally saved someone's life twice at baseball games by catching foul balls that were within where my hand was invading their personal space. Let's put it that way. I was within a half inch or less of their face. One time it was a former player. One time it was an 80-year-old woman sitting next to me who simply didn't see the baseball coming to her. Both times, Ralph, both times we were in the upper deck. Whoa. There's no way you're going to put netting up there. I'm telling you, this is, this is simply an issue for which people must take individual responsibility. If you're going to a I will say the Giants were foremost in this about five years ago. I don't know if they're still doing it. They would, on their telecast, call attention to the fans that made the great catch, that brought their glove. You got and Kruger and Kipe, uh, Kruger and Kipe, always going, got to bring your glove to the game. If you come to the game, bring your old leather, uh, this, that, and the other thing. So they're... Um, and, and wear it and use it. Yeah. I mean, you know, right. you, you, can, you can hold the clipboard in a glove if you're scoring. You know, you're not you're not going to be you don't wear your glove on your writing hand anyway, unless you know you're right. unless you're uh, Pat Zendetti <laughs> right. or Jim Brosnan. I think Jim Brosnan originally wore his glove on on his writing hand, um, but that was silly too. Oh, so. well, that's possible. I, actually, I think Ricky wrote his, wore his glove on his writing hand also, but. Um, that's Ricky uh, Henderson. That's all. Yeah, Ricky. Yeah, you know, remember Ricky was that rare combination of right-handed hitter and left-handed thrower. Oh, that's very. Oh, that's that's what you meant. I I thought he was wearing his glove on uh, while he was giving his Hall of Fame speech, for which he's very famous for I, um, for rehearsing for it. Ricky gave a, an incredibly elegant Hall of Fame speech, and um, 
I still give him a for, lot of For a guy for whose ability to communicate has been ridiculed his whole life, he sure did. Right. Absolutely. And he rehearsed for it. He, he knew it was uh, something that he wanted to dispel, that he could get up there and, and uh, man, because his skills are natural. You know, they did. You don't teach speed, for for instance. So um, I'm proud of Ricky, one of the great characters of all time in baseball. My God, he was he was terrific, um, and could take he Mays and few others could take a ball game upon themselves, and um, you know just determine the way that game came out, and uh, we talked a little off the air, we're going to talk about catchers, but when we talk, um, things go in different directions, and I mentioned the name Willie, Um, I want your reaction to Willie. The Willie? The Willie. Greatest all-around player I've ever seen. Uh, Okay. Bar none. Uh, my hero growing up, um, you know, when I got to meet him, uh, it was, uh, let's just say I'm glad I was an adult and he was done playing when I got to meet him so I could have a sense of perspective and discover that we all have feet of clay in one way or another. Um, Willie, uh, Willie has aged not all that gracefully in the sense that he's, I think Willie's got a lot of bitterness still about uh, how he managed to be probably the greatest player of all time in an era when players were not particularly well compensated for their skills. He looks at what, what's being handed out today. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and you know he looks at what players are being paid today to hit 240. I mean, my, probably my favorite reflection on life by Willie Mays was when Jose Canseco uh, became the first 40-40 player of all time. And when Willie was asked what he thought about it, he said, well, if I'd have known it was such a big deal, I'd have done it a half dozen times. Right. And and there was no boast in that statement. There was no boast in that statement. That was absolute reality. If If Willie had wanted to do that six times, he would have done that six times. The only reason he didn't do it six times was that he was on a team where stolen bases weren't particularly valued at a time in baseball when stolen bases weren't particularly valued. 25 would lead the league. Right. But if there's anybody listening to this podcast who, who honestly thinks that Willie Mays could not have stolen 65 or 70 bases in a season if he wanted to, you're going to have to explain to me why. Right. Well, yeah, Cepeda, McCutcheon, Hart in back of him, um, that that was the reason. <laughs> um, but he could have, absolutely, skills in every which way he had skills. Um, the intangibles, the he'd pick up the sign so he was off. His first step in the outfield when a ball was hit was to the ball. It, um, Hold on that for a second. Just, just stop and let that sentence sink in, Ralph. The man was 300 feet from the catcher, and he could read the signs. Well, just, you're right. Just, just gnaw on that for a moment. <laughs> <clears throat> right. Um, yeah, there were and he direct, times. Other, I can remember him just moving his left fielder over, moving his right yep. fielder over. Well, I was just uh, about to say, there were times when he would reposition his outfield mates before a pitch. Right. Uh, right. And I know, if, remember him doing that a, a lot of times. I went to a lot of games at the stick. Awful lot more the, more games at the stick. You talk about a youth wasted, <laughs> that kind of, kind of stuff. And I I remember him just kind of flicking his glove um, to make that that sign, and players would move. Um, I might have told you this story, Michael, that um, before about um, Willie and his his wit. 
1954, it came down to the last game of the season to determine whether or not Don Mueller, the right fielder, or Willie Mays, the center fielder, was going to win a batting championship. They were both at like 343 or very close. And um, Don Mueller was a very, very slow right fielder. And uh, Monty Irvin was at the end of his career playing left. And Willie had to play this ex- this incredible outfield um, yeah, he almost played foul line to foul line that year. <laughs> yeah, right, foul line to foul. He played it. He played it all. So um, comes time at the end of the game. Willie wins the batting championship. They're having a little press conference. Uh, you know, the reporters gather around, and they're around Mueller. They got Mueller and Willie together, and um, he. Uh, Mueller says, well, if I was going to lose the batting title, I don't feel that bad about losing it to the best center fielder in baseball. And Willie, just as quick, he looks over and goes, the best right fielder in baseball, too. Because <laughs> he, he, <laughs> he was playing right. All Mueller could do is just um, stand there. Well, that, was, that was back in the days when, I mean, everybody thinks that this phrase was coined about Gary Maddox when he was in Philadelphia, but it was really, it was Charlie Dressen who said in the early 50s about Willie Mays, two of the most prescient things ever. One of them is two-thirds of the earth is covered by water and the other third is covered by Willie Mays. Didn't know that. So I was yeah. one who and, thought and, it was... Uh, the former center fielder of the Giants, Gary Maddox. So, no, it was who, earlier than that that the phrase was it was first coined. And the other brilliant thing that I think Dressen also said, he was asked about a ball that um, was hit over Duke Snyder's head in center field in the polo grounds. And uh, his comment was, the only human on earth who could have caught it, hit it. Right. Um, Charlie Dressen, who lost his job because of his wife. <laughs> that, his, his wife demanded the Dodgers give him a two-year contract. And O'Malley, or, or uh, I guess it was Ricky my, uh, back then, they wouldn't give two-year contracts to managers. All these guys. Walter Alston had 19 consecutive one-year deals. Right. Right, it went on all those years, even after they moved to L.A. Mm-hmm. That, but Dressen demanded of the Dodgers, we give him give him two year contract. Well, that didn't happen, and um, he was out on his uh, on his can. Let's put it that way. He went on. He managed a little bit after after losing uh, losing that job. He went on. Yeah, I want to say he might have done the Braves for a little while. I don't. I mean, we're we're going so far into the way back machine that Sherman and Peabody weren't even with me. Right. Even I forget that, and I live in those days. Do you know? Do you play sim balls um, or board games that recreate statistics of the of those teams of those years? There is a company out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania called APBA, A-P-B-A, that has oh, yes. a dice-based simulation. I was actually yes. commissioner of the oldest league in the country for 10 years, Ralph. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> um, so you can imagine uh, sitting around on a cold November day, Rolling the dice and uh, keeping the flames of baseball alive. Um, I do well, that today. Was exactly a... how John Miller got his start. He he played both Appa and Stratomatic and uh, did play by play of his own games, and that's that's where he uh, began the process of discovering his calling. Wow! In, in Hayward, California. Yes, yes, he and his dad would take him out to the to the stick, and he, or maybe no, I think he'd take him out to the Coliseum. As a matter of fact, yeah, I think he spent and, more time in um, Oakland. 
yeah, he re- he'd um, record games, and uh, which that's another thing. It's practice. It's reps, like anything else. A lot of it is that. The, but um, like Vin Scully, I can, I can tell you, I can tell you this, Ralph. Um, I have a secondary job in addition to my baseball jobs, and that is for ESPN. I work college football for their entire season. I've done it for about 10 years now. And my job is to be, uh, to use a modern term, embedded with the official stats crew up in the press box. And I call the game down to the TV truck where the graphics people are inputting each and every play real time as it occurs into software that allows them to pop up all those statistics off the score bug on the bottom, you know, that started, you know, so-and-so started completing none of his first five passes and he's seven of eight cents, or he threw his first two passes to the left and then he's thrown his last nine to the right, or whatever the, the goofy numbers are that they come up with. And so I'm sitting there on a headset, latch open, literally kind of a rush, right, 23, to the 36-yard line, the 36 is confirmed, we're coming up on second and three. People listening to me include the guy who puts up the down and distance overlay on the screen from sport vision or the first down marker, all of that stuff. And I can tell you, it is, you have to be totally invested in what you're doing to be able to see somebody break a 79-yard punt return and describe it and not just sit there and watch it. It is not easy to actually form the words and describe the play as it's happening to people and keep in mind that they can't see what's going on, although down in the truck they do have monitors. But still, you know, your job is to keep them fully informed of what's going on by total concentration it. on your part. Well, total. and it's not it's not just total concentration on your part. It's also remembering that even though they can see it, they're relying on you to describe it. And to a certain extent, that's what that radio broadcast is like. Now, I did some radio broadcasts of, of basketball while I was in college uh, on our college uh, station. And it turns out it's a hell of a lot easier to watch the game than it is to both watch and describe the game. Oh, I can well appreciate that. I can well appreciate Now, you grew up in L.A., am I correct? Well, I grew up in California. I think that's the best way to put it. I was born in East L.A. We moved to Lafayette, California when I was three. We moved to Sacramento when I was six. We moved to San Diego uh, in the middle of seventh grade, and then we moved to Pasadena in the middle of high school, and then I went back down to San Diego for college before moving up to the Bay Area for the rest of my life. Well, the, the reason I asked that question was to determine how much, when you did your basketball announcing, broadcasting, how much of Chick Hearn did you take with you? None. And the reason I took none with me was because I couldn't. I wasn't good enough. I would have loved to have taken a little of Chick with me. I would have, but, but for the most part, my basketball career spent, was spent uh, with me trying to get out of the popcorn machine. <laughs> yes. Take them out of the popcorn, popcorn <laughs> machine. Man. Um. Uh, you listened to Bill King up here do basketball as well, didn't you? Oh, of course, of course. Uh, I, Was he a I master had, at that or what? Uh, Bill, you know, every time I, I used to see the Dos Equis commercials with the, the, the bearded guy as the most interesting man in the world. Yes, yes. I, I saw him. Bill King. I saw Bill <laughs> King. Because Bill King probably was the real life most interesting man in the world a guy who was a a world class sailor who could uh, expound for an hour without even taking a breath on Russian opera on the merits of Eugene Onegin as a metaphor for life in Tsarist Russia Uh, a guy 
who I don't think ever owned a car that wasn't salvage titled. <laughs> <laughs> Just a fascinating, fascinating guy. You know, a guy who who once agreed to take a Sports Illustrated writer around with him for a whole week to do a a profile, and the writer got into Bill's car at the at the stadium to drive to his houseboat in Sausalito and looked down and realized that there was no floor on the passenger side of the car. He had to put his feet up on the dash. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, this was, you know, a man, a man who was legendary for eating some of the vilest foods you can conceive of. You know, his mid-game snack would be popcorn with chili and raw onions. Right. Now, you Giant fans out there, if you want to listen how the, Bill King is tied to the Giants, few know that Bill King was the third announcer in the booth in 1958 when Lon correct. and Russ Hodges were um, uh, came out, or Russ Hodges came out here, Lon got the job, Bill King was the third guy in the booth, and... The, the producer of the show was a man named Muley. Now, Franklin Muley, Franklin right. Muley went on to hire Bill King as uh, the Warriors announcer. Later on, went on to naturally own the Warriors. He was the producer of um, of that radio broadcast when yeah the play-by-play broadcast in the, in the first year the Giants came out of here. So we tie it in with the Giants, Bill King. And when you think of Lon Simmons, you automatically think um, of his days with the A's and being partnered with um, with Bill King. That was a terrific partnership. That was fun to listen to those two together. They complemented each other beautifully. Possibly, possibly the funniest thing I ever heard on a baseball broadcast. Um, when Jose Canseco came up and was a, was a rookie with the A's, um, he, Lon uh, pronounced his name with a little bit of a flat Midwestern accent, if you will. He called him Ken Seiko. And... Um, Bill would correct him on the air. Say, he's Hispanic, Lon. That's Con Seiko. Con Seiko. And and Lon always took it with a chuckle, and and allowed it to just roll off his back. So one night, um, it was time for the switchover, seventh inning, and you know, Lon said, and uh, when we come back after these words, Bill will take you the rest of the way. And then, unfortunately, Bill had had a little too much popcorn with chili that night, and uh, he had to leave the booth and was not there to start the seventh inning. So we're back on the air, and the producer points at Lon. He says, well, we're back for the seventh inning. Uh, The more astute amongst you will notice that this is still Lon. Uh, Bill has been unavoidably detained in the con. (laughs) <laughs> that is a great line. That is a very, very funny line. Unavoidable incident in the con. <laughs> great. I remember poor Lon. They when the Giants after the game he'd interview the stars of the game. And when they came over here, folks like Marichal, um uh the Alus, uh, Jose Pagan from Puerto Rico, they spoke very little English. And Lon would ask him a three-sentence question, no, Lon, <laughs> yes, Lon. <laughs> I guess, um, whoever of marriage said, well, Lon, no, Lon. <laughs> you know? um, great teams that, that he called, that Russ and Lon called in the 60s. Unbelievable. Oh, gosh. Um, speaking of, well, well, let's, let's, let's get back let's, to let's, catchers let's, and talk about some of those catchers. Back. Yeah, 
from the beginning, the first one that I remember was the opening day cast here in San Francisco, which is Obi Landra. Was he? Uh, yeah, he was the opening day I cast thought in San Francisco. It was, okay, that uh, because ironically, the Mets, the number one draft choice of the Mets uh, when they expanded, as Casey would say, if you don't have a catcher, you get a lot of pass balls. Um, yeah, if you don't have a catcher, you, you know, you just. The umpire gets very irritated very quickly. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Bouncing it off his shin and what have you, yes. So, But Hobie Landreth gave me uh, a terrific interview on, on these air, airwaves a while. One of the nicest people you'll ever meet. <laughs> Absolutely. And is instrumental in the Giants Fantasy Camp, which uh, is run by John Lackey. And um, if you, if No, 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 no. Uh, Good, good try, John Lackey. Bill Lackey. Bill Lackey. It's run by Bill Lasky. Bill Lasky. Bill Lasky. Yes. Bill Lasky, not John Lackey. Change. You know, you put a few extra sentences, words in there, or letters in there, changes the whole thing. Yes, Bill Lasky and Hobie uh, just holds court in in that fantasy camp, and he's well into his 80s, and still hanging hanging in there. Um, what were your memories of him from those days? Um, you know, when you're seven years old and you get Major League Baseball on the radio for the first time, your memories are just, how lucky can I be? You know, when's the next game? You know, I, uh, I get to sit here and listen to this in my room and nobody bothers. This is the coolest thing in the world. Um, Michael, you, know, you I, got I, the you you were taking my team. Do you know that all we had when all we Giant fans of New York had those first few years was less Kiter reproductions of the game, like on ticker tape, like Ronald Reagan used to do it with the Cubs, and um, we missed them. So I was 11, and I was a kid when they left. I was pretty heartbroken. I got to tell you. But I've talked to and an awful know, lot, and I tried not to be bitter, Michael. I talked to a lot of people who were uh, kids and uh, benefited from it. So um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I, 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 I just want you to realize that their moving out here brought you here. And now that you're here, you have to admit that being here at our age is better than being there at our age. No question it's about it. But let's be clear. The United States Air Force, which I joined to keep from wearing khaki in Vietnam, long story, but um, sent me out from uh, where I grew up in New York to San Francisco to Travis Air Force Base halfway between Sacramento and San Francisco, and that's how I spent um, the war years. And when I got out of the service, I stayed out here because you were absolutely correct. As Leonard Coppett said, the reason he moved out here was not because New York was so bad, just as you said, it's better here than there. Um yeah, it's a struggle to find a good bagel here, but the rest of it you can probably take, you know, and there are no good Romanian restaurants like there are down on 2nd Avenue, but... No, know, but the, have the, our the pizza's here. caught up in California. There's some, yep. I'll tell you, Alameda Pizza on Webster Street, where you and I live in Alameda, is um, as good as New York pizza, and I can say that because I went back there last year with my sweetie tally and we tested new york pizza and there was some some of it was great none was really um as better than alameda pizza on webster and they don't even sponsor this show so but you uh just caught up the weather will will always be tremendous there's still there's something about new york though i'll, I'll tell you as i look back it's great place to great place for me to visit um, at, at this point. And uh, there's a spirit in New York, especially around sports, that can't be re- reproduced out here. I got to tell you that, Michael. I I do agree with you. Although I will say this, and and 
uh, no less an expert on this subject than Brian Sabian, who uh, worked for the New York Yankees and grew up in New Hampshire, um, would agree with this. In, in the year 2010, when the Giants finally broke their 57-year drought, I think it was, and, and uh, won a World Series, San Francisco became a baseball town like New York. It became a town where people stopped, you know, waving to the camera on their cell phones and started paying 100% attention to what was going on down on the field. And it is, in at least in baseball terms, it's much more of an East Coast town now after three world championships than it was before that. Um, I, I think I that, agree. you know, I think that some of, uh, some of New York's, um, aura and mystique comes from the sense of entitlement that you get for excellence and for championships uh, when you're in a town where one of your teams seems to be in the World Series every year. Well, you know, maybe I'm, I'm thinking of it in terms of somebody who watched the A's win five pennants in a row, couple, you know, and um, three ch- world championships in a row in that streak, and did got very very little support. And I'm sure things have changed, uh, and they obviously had uh, with the Giants. It all revolved around that new ballpark, uh, the support they got at the stick, uh, um, and what it took <laughs> for them. Well. To, to build the, the new ballpark, how many times did they come up voting um, and come up short? Um, four. They, they lost four elections. And, and, they, you know, and that when they're you talk here about now is an absolute miracle uh, when you think about it. As close as they came to moving to uh, Toronto once, uh, St. Petersburg, this, that, and the other thing, it's a miracle that, that they made it through. And it's well, not just a miracle. It's a miracle that you can actually attribute almost exclusively to two people. And the two yeah. people are are Bill White and um, Peter O'Malley. Well, with Bill White, um, you, you can tell the story better than I can, but Bill White was um, a hater of St. Petersburg. He had to suffer the indignities of having the Cardinals train down there, and Bill White and Kurt Flood and all these guys could not stay with their team because right. of the, the craziness that was going on. And to be honest, it's still going on in this in this world, in this country. But that's for another show. Um, and Bill White, um, when it came down to it, was the commissioner of the National League. And when it came down to the Giants make, making that move, he says, over my dead body, <laughs> literally said that. Um, and, and and so did Peter O'Malley. I, I wrote to all of the owners in baseball when they were considering that move. I wrote them all an identical letter that was very fact-based, talking about uh, market size, talking about per capita income, talking about a whole variety of things there about why why the National League did not want to abandon the fourth largest market, fifth largest TV market to the American League, et cetera, et cetera. I got responses from exactly two people. I got a wonderful response from Bill White, and I got a heartfelt response from Peter O'Malley, who said, I am acutely aware of the role my father played in getting the Giants to San Francisco and of the role that that team plays in the city's fabric. And you may rest assured that they will not leave California as long as I am in charge of the Dodgers. Oh, that's very, very interesting. Very so interesting. It's, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of shocking to me, you know, of all the teams. You know, to have your your bitterest rival be the one that that steps up and says, uh, "Fear not, Giants fan, we're on the case." That's what's the interesting part. Now, 
I will, because time is short, I will segue that to another catcher we're talking about with the Giants, who went on, he, to, uh, Tom Haller, who played an instrumental part in the 62 um, uh, championship team. He uh, platooned, if you will, with, uh, God, I, just his name, absolutely. He platooned with Ed Bailey. Ed Bailey, another left-handed hitting <clears throat> catcher, and uh, they did the job, and they won. Well, Tom Halla went on to play with those Dodgers, and um, he had one of those rare guys. He had half his career with the Giants, half his career with the Dodgers, and um, his um, the late Tom Haller. His son, Timmy, was a co-host on this show for quite some time and taught me a lot about Tom and um, the class that he showed when um, he moved moved down there. He took over as the regular catcher with the Dodgers. Sandy Koufax was uh, Don Drysdale those days and um, a pretty remarkable, remarkable guy. The thing that I remember about him when I was a kid, when he made it to the big leagues, he gave back his scholarship. He, he paid um, University of Illinois. He was on a football scholarship. Um, he paid whatever he got, he paid back, gave them a bunch of cash. And others have done stuff like that, too, but it was the, he was the first have done that that I remember. Um, the first player to have done that. I thought that out of class. And um, that was my Tom Haller story. Um, what are your memories? Well, I had never Tom? heard that story about Tom. Uh, I wonder if Dick Buck has just scared him into doing it. <laughs> that very well could have been. Very well. You know, we get off on you talk about football, you're maybe Dick Butkus was an animal. I mean, in his day, you mentioned that, that name. He would have scared anybody. That was um those Chicago teams were terrific. Uh Gale Sayers and um and what have you. Mr. Uh, Duke, I, 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 I totally agree with you. I will just close with a quick anecdote, tell you that since this is also passed one of the past things that has happened at what we now know as AT&T Park was the East-West Shrine game. Um, and uh, that was headquartered in San Francisco for a long, long, long time, postseason Did all-star Did that die football. out? I haven't yeah, thought I, of something I hadn't moved, thought about. It moved east, and I don't know if it still exists or not anymore, Ralph, but I do know this. We had a couple of games at AT&T Park, and at one of them – The media had an open interview opportunity to interview the people who were being inducted into the East West Shrine Hall of Fame that year. And so I showed up at 8 o'clock in the morning and was ushered into a room with a Secret Service person, Gerald Ford, and Dick Butkus, just the four of us, because nobody else came for the interview. So I got to sit and talk to those guys for an hour, essentially off the record, about football. And I think um, I think I might have been the most blessed person on the planet then. Uh, how many people get to sit in a room with an ex-president? I mean, literally sitting next to him, you know, where you would turn towards each other to talk and, uh, and discuss the college football days at Michigan. He played without a helmet. Yeah, well, he played with a leather helmet. He was accused leather of helmet, playing right. without a helmet. He was accused of playing without a helmet by LBJ, but he actually played with a leather helmet. Okay. And he laughed about that. He said, you know, I asked him about that, and he said, well, you know, uh, the president might have been right. <laughs> <laughs> Self-effacing, a, a good man. Who could spend 27 years in the House of Representatives and never have a bill pass in his name? But um, he was what he was. And 
I'll tell, tell you a little interesting story. The day he pardoned Richard Nixon, I was in Las Vegas at Caesar's Palace to see Frank Sinatra, Nancy Sinatra, and Frank Jr. on stage at the same time with each other. And um, the word came down that um, Ford had pardoned Nixon. And um, I think that was good. Looking back, I think that probably closed some wounds and it put the, brought the country together and we went on to do other things besides... Um, um, in a way, in a, in a way, he wasn't punished, and that begat a lot of things in the Republican Party amongst presidents that continue to go unpunished. But that for another show, am I right? <laughs> we can't end on that. Yeah, pr- probably one that I shouldn't be involved in, too. <laughs> well, okay. That... Um, a uh, uh, show that you, uh, the future show, you mean? <laughs> no. Um, for my blood pressure, it's probably a show that I shouldn't be involved in either, if you think about it. Um, yeah, because, you know, <laughs> it is crazily depressing. Let's put it that way. But, um, yeah, can't we think of something time. to show on that isn't crazily de- de- depressing? Uh, give me a Dick, uh, a Dick Deeds story, speaking of former... All right, all right, all right. Here's a Dick Deeds story for you. So I'm a senior in high school. It's, uh, I think, probably May, late May. And uh, I'm in Pasadena, and I decide that uh, the best way for me to get into the ballpark and enjoy a ball game is to work as a vendor. So I go to Dodger Stadium, and I apply, and I get hired, and uh, I am, as all new people are, blessed with carrying a case, a wooden case with glass bottles of Fresca, around the ballpark trying to convince people to buy this awful-tasting diet beverage. The worst part about it, Ralph, is when you were out of product, when you had nothing left to sell, you still had 40 pounds of case and empty bottles hanging around your neck. The commissary was all the way down underneath the right field corner. My post was the third deck down the left field line, so I was trudging forever where I couldn't even sell carrying these bottles. And the night that I worked was the night that Harry Wendelstedt decided to become the only umpire in history to invoke the you didn't try hard enough to get out of the way rule on Dick Eats and thereby preserve what I've always considered to be a bogus record for uh, Don Drysdale. That was the night that he set the, uh, the consecutive inning scoreless record. And for those who weren't there or don't remember, Dietz was hit in the side by a pitch with the bases loaded, but denied the opportunity to take his base because rookie umpire Harry Wendelstedt, Hunter's dad, uh, Hunter's current umpire, decided that Shows you how old we are. Yeah. Decided that uh, Dietz did not try hard enough to get out of the way, which, of course, outraged me as a Giants fan because I said, have you ever seen the man play? How would you know if he was trying to get out of the way? It takes him about four seconds to begin to move. <laughs> uh, there was a reason that Dick's nickname was the Mule. Yes, yes, but what a great, what a nice man. Went on to uh, actually manage an independent ball up in Sonoma. I think he, I think yes, he, he managed did. Sonoma. I Crushers. got to see him up there, the, the Crushers, and another. Uh, person, another uh, former Giants who managed up there, was Honey Bear, Mr. Mitchell. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. I think Daryl Thomas yeah. did some work up there, too, didn't he? Uh, I don't know, but I would love, I think I told you my Daryl Thomas story. Yeah. Was, um, managing um, in Bend, Oregon. In 
1985. I was the TOPS representative, and I went up there to sign players to their TOPS contracts. And I got to watch he and a fellow by the name of uh, Turner later went on to coach the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, But Daryl Thomas managed in a game against Turner where they were the first two blacks to manage against each other in organized baseball's history. Um, when Frank Robinson was manager in Cleveland, Biden. there were the blacks for, for him to manage against. This was the mid-'80s, and um, I went up to Darrell, got to meet Darrell Thomas, and told him how ashamed I was of mankind that it took um, – that this took forever, and um, we both kind of teared up at that, because, um, yeah, yeah, Darrell Thomas, yeah. Darryl Thomas is another guy that played with both the Giants and Dodgers, very, very underrated, um, versatile, fast, tremendous fielder, played center field, played played the infield, um, good guy as well as a good, good ball player as well as a good guy, so... Yeah. See how names we just take a name, we go off to different tangents. This is fun, Michael. Always enjoy it, Ralph. See you next week. Next week, same time, same bat channel as Alan Blumkin would say. See you then. Everybody out there, keep on keeping on. If you get anything out of this that remotely um if you enjoy this remotely as much as we do talking about it, then uh, I'm happy for you. Be well, Michael. See you next week. Thanks, Ralph. Keep on keeping on.